Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be restoring this mangled iPhone XR that has been run over by a lawnmower. The back, screen and frame have all been obliterated in the lower corner. From the right angle, you can see directly into the phone. We won't know the full extent of the damage until we open the phone, but I can already see some rust. This phone was purchased on eBay in its current condition from someone who had purchased it themselves to use as parts. As it was locked, they sold it onto me. Opening up the parcel, I found a little note inside from the seller. Turns out, they're a huge fan of the channel. Let's see what we can do with their phone. The first thing I'll need to do is test the phone itself. Does it actually work and what parts am I going to need? I will open up the phone by removing the two pentalobe screws at the bottom before prying up the display. As the seller had already opened this phone up himself, the display came up without any heat. I'll start by removing the main bracket covering the LCD display cable. There's a small barcode on the cable itself that indicates what brand of display is fitted. We'll need a replacement of the same brand later on, so it's important to take note of it now. I'll continue by removing the remaining two brackets and the flex cables for both the battery and display. Setting the screen aside, we can get a proper look at the internals. The blade has not only cut through the frame, but into the Taptic engine. The charging port is also badly broken with a microphone ripped from its cable. The liquid indicators are also red with rust surrounding the Taptic engine and a small amount of corrosion. My guess would be the wet blades from the lawnmower have introduced a small amount of liquid inside. I've purchased a new display so I can test out the phone. This is a refurbished Toshiba display. Included with it was a card that explains the issues that may arise if the wrong branded display is installed. As I have the wider barcode, I'll be installing a Toshiba display panel onto this iPhone XR. After connecting its two flex cables and reattaching the battery, we can finally test out the phone. With the press of a power button, nothing happened. But that was to be expected as it's probably flat. So I tried a lightning charger. Still, nothing. Losing hope, I tried the wireless charger. And sure enough, this time around, the battery flat icon appeared with the phone booting shortly after. With no passcode in place, I was able to browse around. As it turns out, this phone hasn't been used since early 2019. In settings, it even thinks it's still under warranty. While we're also in the about section, we can see it's running iOS 12.2 and is a 128 gig model. With the heart of the phone alive, it's time to get the rest of this phone fully functional and in great cosmetic condition. With the new display out of the way, I can get to work on removing the SIM reader. This is one of the select few iPhones to feature a modular SIM reader. This means you can swap it out with a dual SIM model to have two physical SIM cards. Next, the logic board needs to come out. After unplugging several flex cables attaching to it, four screws can be unfastened and the board can be lifted free. Proceeding, I can remove the single camera from the iPhone XR after removing its bracket. Down at the bottom, this is where things get interesting. Some of these components I'll be able to reuse, others not. The Taptic engine doesn't work, the charging port is damaged, along with the antenna cable below it. So I'll need to replace these. I had a bit of difficulty getting out a screw that had rusted in place, but with some persistence, I got it out. It's amazing to think that if this damage had occurred 5 centimeters higher, it would have cut into the battery and likely would have caused the whole phone to combust. Removing what's left of the charging port and the antenna below it, we can finally take out the battery. After removing the two bottom strips, it was time for the top ones, although I couldn't get to them as they were stuck down too tightly. So I had to resort to using some alcohol and prying to get the battery free. Now we're getting down to the lower level components. As we're swapping the phone into a new housing, everything inside needs to be removed and transferred into that new housing. This is easier said than done. 
Unfortunately, iPhones have the most amount of components, screws, brackets, and other tiny little components when compared to other smartphones. As such, this process is extremely time consuming. After removing the wireless charging module, the insides of this phone look empty. But there's still a few more cables, antennas, brackets, clips, springs, and mesh grills that all need to come out. After removing this top antenna from the phone, there is still a couple of gold contacts and some pads that are sitting behind them that need to come out. Hiding behind this piece of plastic is the volume and mute switch which will need to be unfastened and removed. It's connected via a flex cable to the power button, LED flash, and rear microphone. This flex cable needs to be removed delicately as it's very easy to damage. Under that cable is a piece of plastic that helps guide the LED flash into place as well as a tiny mesh grill for the microphone. We'll remove these too. On the sides, there are several clips which help hold in the LCD display panel. These will need to be unfastened and removed from the phone. Of course, we can't forget the SIM eject pin, which helps the SIM card tray eject from the SIM reader. At this point, I'll take out the spring and retaining brackets from both the volume and power buttons. Lastly, the NFC antenna can be removed before the mesh grills from the microphone and speaker ports. There are plastic pieces that hold the mesh grills in place, so they'll need to come out first. Once they're out, each grill can be taken out and put aside. This fiddly and time-consuming process is why many people who crack the fragile glass back on their iPhone don't get it fixed. However, if you wanted to attempt something like this yourself, get a housing with all the small components already installed. I do this myself, but I have a plan for this phone that requires me to remove everything. At this stage, we finally removed everything. So what's the plan? Well, I'm gonna be putting these components in a new housing. I purchased this red one for just $10. It was so cheap as it lacks any branding. No Apple logo, no iPhone text. Of course, I'm not going to all this trouble to fix this phone and have a generic back. Instead, I'm going to make my own custom housing in a red and black theme. So along with the housing, I also purchased a black replacement glass panel. Merging the two together, hopefully we'll have a really nice custom phone. To separate the already installed red glass, I'll need to use my laser machine. Using a template and a protective shield over the housing, I should be able to remove the glue using a laser and not damage the frame. After I'd positioned the laser, I started the burn process, which takes about 10 minutes to complete. While I don't get to use my laser machine all that much, it is a super handy tool when I need it. I have made a dedicated video about it and how it works if you want to know more about the process. The result was not as I'd hoped. The physical shield I placed over the phone that cost me $15 was ineffective and didn't protect the laser from etching the side of the housing. So I'll need to redo this process with another housing. This time, I made sure the software template was significantly smaller than the phone itself, so it wouldn't happen again. This time, it was spot on, so I can proceed to removing the glass. The glue used by Apple is like cement and is extremely hard to remove, even after burning it with a laser. But this aftermarket housing, well, it came out so much easier. I will still have to break the glass to fully remove it, as the glass sits under that camera lens. With only the bare frame left, we are almost ready to install the new sheet of glass. But before we can do so, the frame needs to be cleaned up and have any remaining glue removed. After having cleaned off the frame using some alcohol, it's now time to apply the new glue. This glue was supplied with my laser machine and is what I've used on the few back glass replacements I've done. I'll apply a bead around the perimeter and on the center of the device. After which the glass panel can be attached and the residual glue that seeped out the sides can be wiped off with a tissue. To make sure the panel sits flush, I'll apply some rubber bands to hold it in place 
while the glue dries. As the new glass won't sit under the camera lens, we'll need to fill that void with glue to ensure the red ring around the lens doesn't fall down. After that's done, I can install the camera lens into the frame. One dilemma I had was what colour should the buttons be? Black or red? What would you choose? I like the look of both, but ultimately chose the red ones that blend in with the frame. The new red buttons come pre-installed with their black grommets, so they're ready to go in. Although this phone isn't back together yet, I'm already loving this black and red design. I have attempted it before on another iPhone XR, although did it the other way round, with a black frame and red back. That configuration didn't look great at all, but this time around, I think I've got it right. Once the power and volume buttons are installed, it's time for the mute switch. It's fastened into place onto the flex cable itself. I'll need to loosen two strips to remove the old mute switch before I can install the red one. After tightening those straps back down, that flex cable can now be attached into the phone. With that cable installed, it's time for the NFC antenna to be installed up top next to that camera lens before the wireless charging module can be reattached into position. Using some E8000 liquid adhesive, this wireless charging coil isn't going anywhere. After reinstalling the two screws going to a random sensor in the frame, I can start reattaching the LCD display brackets after first bending back the really bent one that was down at the lower section in our old frame. With this build, I'm trying to reuse as much of the components that came out as I possibly can. Of course, some things like the Taptic engine were just too far gone and didn't function at all, so will need to be replaced. But as for that display bracket, it was easily bent back into position. Up at the top, there's some gold contacts, foam pads, and an antenna that need to be fastened back into place. It has a few loose pieces that need to be attached on some screw holes so using some tweezers, I can line those up correctly. The tedious process of reinstalling the mesh grills and plastic retaining pieces will be undertaken next. Many technicians who perform a housing swap will miss out on things like this. While I do my repairs properly, it's not hard to understand why steps like these get missed. With that job done, it's now time to install the lower antenna and charging port. These are both new components that I'll be installing. I've chosen a red charging port for this phone to match in with the red frame. I will install the microphone bracket next before the speaker and new Taptic engine go in. As these pieces are being installed, the phone is starting to come together. After the lower section of the phone is assembled, it's time to move back up to the top where I'm going to install the rear-facing camera. After placing the module back in, I'll clean it off before installing its bracket and two screws. It is finally time for the logic board to be reinstalled. Positioning it down into place, making sure no flex cables are trapped beneath it, I can reinstall the four screws and start reconnecting all of the flex cables that attach to our logic board. With that, it's time to install the front facing cameras and the three cables connecting to the logic board. It's important that none of these get damaged or Face ID will not function. After reinstalling the SIM eject pin, the SIM card reader can be reinstalled with its three screws. Before installing the new display, we first need to program it using a display reprogrammer tool in order to retain Apple's True Tone function. 
For this, I'll copy the serial numbers from our old display over to our new one. Before we can discard the old display, we'll also need to remove the earpiece flex cable which houses some of the components used for Apple's Face ID system. If these are damaged or not installed, the Face ID system won't function, as both the earpiece flex cable and front facing cameras are paired to each iPhone's motherboard, a replacement won't fix the issue, so it's vital that these remain intact throughout the repair. After it's swapped across to our new display panel, it's time to install the battery. I'll reapply some fresh battery adhesive strips before seating it down into position in our iPhone XR. After which, a dust and water resistant seal can be applied to the frame of the phone. After positioning it down into place, the protective film can be removed and our new display panel can be attached to the phone. I'll reinstall the two brackets and several tri-wing screws before reattaching the battery and installing the last remaining bracket. Finally, the internals of the device can be wiped down with a microfiber cloth to remove any fingerprints or dust remaining inside before the protective film over the adhesive is removed and the display panel is seated into position to our new housing. The two pentalobe screws can be reinstalled into the bottom of the phone as well as the SIM card tray before we remove the plastic protective film from both the back and front of the display. As for the device being locked, well I took care of that and had iCloud switched off. Now all that's left to do is reset the phone and remove the last owner's stuff. And with that, we're done. So this is it. A once junk iPhone XR has been restored and customized with a red and black design. I think it looks really good and definitely makes it stand out from the crowd. What we're left with is a fully working iPhone XR 128GB on iOS 12.2. It has 100% battery health and only 52 charge cycles. Given just how few charges this battery has seen, shows just how short of a life this iPhone XR has had. With a red frame and a black back, this iPhone XR now looks a lot like my BlackBerry Key 2 LE, which has the same color scheme. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.